Okay, good morning, everyone, and it's great to see you all, even though we're in our boxes today. Um, we're taking up part two of our National Register Advisory Committee meeting, and I am welcoming back Ramona Bartos. Um, glad to see you in the house, and we would just go ahead and get started. I'm going to do the roll call, um, and then we can get started with the formal program. So I'll just say I, when I call your name, David Burkstone. Here. David Denard. Here. David Ruffin. Here. Fred Belladin. We know Joe Opper Opperman is here. He's just having difficulty hearing us. Josie Ward. I see Josie. Just say Here. hello. <laughs> Mary Beth Fitz. Here. Honorable Newell Clark. Hi. Sean Patch. I'm here. And Dr. Brothers. Hi, I'm here. And those are um, the committee members. And I know staff is here. Thank you so much. And we would like to go ahead and get started. And we have, um, I'm bouncing between screens here. We have the study list and we have our East region. And that will be, um, our consultants will be bringing that to us. Johnson, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, oh, I saw I'm Sean sorry. Patch's I saw Sean Patch's hand up, but I now it's disappeared. Yeah. Okay. Ramona, quick question for you. Uh, in terms of potential conflicts, my company is has prepared the, the presentation for the for the Hope County. Do I need to recuse myself from that? I just want to ask your guidance on this. Oh, yes, I forgot. We've we've lost more Ramona. <laughs> yep, I see that. Um <laughs> Hopefully she'll pop back on here. I don't, um, I don't, I don't see a conflict. It's not, there's not like a financial um, implication. Okay. Just wanted to ask. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. Cause that reminds me, I should, I do need to ask if there are any other perceived um, conflicts of interest, you should state so now and then remind us when we come to that property. So let's uh, Dr. Johnson, yes. I'm sorry to uh -huh. interrupt again. Um, Ramona, okay. uh, Ramona does think that um, Sean probably does need to recuse from the voting. Um, I think he he can um, he can definitely stay on, and I hope we'll stay on for the presentation. But um, just recuse for the voting. Okay. On Hope County. That's noted, and we'll remind you. Thank you, Sean. Now <laughs> we're getting started with um, the first property presentation. Okay, Dr. Johnson, thank you for stepping in as chair this morning. This is Beth King. I'm the architectural survey coordinator for those who might not have met me. And I want to say thank you for coming to this special meeting this morning. We believe this is the first time in our in our department history that we have um, done something like this. And it's a reflection of the high volume of survey projects that we're undertaking right now. Um, particularly countywide surveys, which, as many of you know, because of your expertise in the field of preservation, are often very long and complicated projects, usually multi-year, multi-phase projects. Um, so today, first, we'll be looking at Edgecombe County, which I will be playing a video the consultants recorded earlier this week uh, because they were not able to attend the meeting at this time. And that is the first of three counties that are currently being uh, surveyed for the second time. They were surveyed in the 1980s, and we're doing an update with some funding from the Department of Transportation as a result of the uh, CCX terminal that's being constructed or will be constructed in Rocky Mount. So Edgecombe will be our first project to conclude. Later on, we'll also be seeing projects from City of Wilson and Wilson County and Rocky Mount and Nash County. And then the second presentation we'll see today 
is one of our Emergency Supplemental Historic Preservation Fund surveys. And this is the, Hope County is the first of the seven counties that are being surveyed with that uh, bucket of money to conclude. And so you'll be seeing in the future presentations from Cumberland, Person, Polk, McDowell, Montgomery, and um, Vance counties also under this funding source. And then lastly, we have a presentation from Salisbury, which is one of our municipal survey updates. And that is a project that was funded through our annual historic preservation fund grant that's offered to certified local governments. So that's a more normal, you know, we do this just about every October um, kind of presentation, but we're very excited um, to also have, to be continuing to do our normal work with certified local governments, even as we're doing these larger and less common countywide survey projects. Um, so unless anyone has any questions for me, I'm going to try to share my screen and get our, our first presentation underway. Okay, would someone verbally um, confirm that this appears to be working? We are. We yep. see it. We're just see waiting it for website. it to go. Okay, great. When I push play, this is going to start very quickly. There's no preamble. So, Sarah, if you would just text me if something appears to be not working correctly. All right. Will do. Thank you. Oh, never mind. There's pre. Not uh, so. We we'll start, David. We'll Oops. start with you. I'm so sorry. Well, I um, am chair of the store. I am so sorry. That's the wrong video. That's the that's the recording from the last meeting. Um, do you, I'm so sorry. I downloaded this yesterday, but I must have downloaded both of them by mistake. We'll, we'll take uh, this moment. I'll ask great. Joe if he's able to hear us. In February 2021, after our survey of Tarboro. Okay, I'm sorry. Yep, that's that's the one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me try one more time to share. Okay. Okay. All right. And now I think this is going to be correct. Yes, that's the one. We began documenting buildings, structures, and landscapes in the rural part of Edgecombe County including all of the county's towns outside of Rocky Mount, which is currently being surveyed by another consultant. Today, we will present the list of properties that appear potentially eligible for the National Register in rural Edgecombe County. First, a little background. Located in North Carolina's upper coastal plain, Edgecombe County was formed in 1741, but achieved its current boundaries in 1883 and now covers 511 square miles. The Tar River cuts across the county from the west at Rocky Mount, meandering uh, through Tarboro and proceeding to Pitt County to eventually reach the Pamlico Sound at Washington. Not surprisingly, topography in the county is flat. The Tar and its tributaries combined with the county's fertile soil, the region's long growing season and efficient transportation, including early railroad access, have made Edgecombe a center for cotton, tobacco, corn, and peanut farming, as well as commercial forestry. With the emphasis on cash crops, tenancy and sharecropping dominated farm operations after the Civil War and for much of the 20th century. Agriculture remains the basis of the county's economy, but today large agribusinesses, some formed by local families, cultivate many of the vast fields spanning the rural countryside. Edgecombe has been the subject of several architectural surveys, but two in particular documented the greatest number of historic resources. In 1977, staff from the State Historic Preservation Office conducted the Tar Noose Survey. That project included Tarboro, but also 80 of the most well-known rural buildings, mostly dwellings. <clears throat> In 1984-85, historian Henry Taves documented over 400 
properties in rural Edgecombe, a survey that did not include any of the towns. Our survey aimed to update the survey files generated in these two projects, as well as survey files created outside of those undertakings, including before the TAR News survey in the earliest days of the state's historic preservation program. What we found while updating old files was at times disheartening. Only two of the 26 Rosenwald schools remain, and many of the county's earliest federal and Greek revival houses have been lost. As in other primarily agricultural counties, outbuildings such as flu curing tobacco barns have been left to deteriorate as the crop has declined in prevalence and curing technology has changed. <clears throat> but as much as we mourned many losses, losses, we were buoyed by the 19th century houses that have been lovingly restored and the mid 20th century resources that continue to tell the story of a people and their architectural heritage. Since the mid 1980s, several buildings have been listed in the National Register, including some that you see on the screen here. In addition to updating older survey files, we newly recorded 342 properties. These included dwellings, farms, churches, agricultural industrial structures, and several schools, mostly African American schools built after Brown v. Board of Education and before integration in the early 1970s. Many of the properties we documented were in the county's towns, including Princeville, Speed, Pine Tops, Canita, Macclesfield, Whitakers, Leggett, and Battleboro, but most were rural. We were fortunate to encounter many residents who took an interest in our work, showed us buildings we might not have recognized as important otherwise, and told us stories about their family farms, country stores, mule barns, and cemeteries. As a result of our work, we now present our study list for Edgecombe County. We'll start with the houses. Dr. James Jones Phillips established Mount Moriah Farm in the early 19th century. The main house results from two construction periods beginning around 1815, when a federal two-story side gable dwelling was built with a single shoulder chimney. That section now serves as the rear, rear L for the 1851 Greek, revi Greek revival style addition. That addition includes large six over six windows. Throughout the interior, original finishes remain intact and are well preserved by the descendants of the original owner, Dr. Phillips. Outbuildings on the 542 acre farm include a tenant house, silo, pack house with ordering pit, a smokehouse, livestock barn, cook's house, and a garage. On the site, but barely visible behind the cook's house is what is known as the old house, a three bay building with mortise and tenon framing dating from the early 19th century. Mount Moriah is eligible under criterion C for architecture and possibly A for agriculture, but more research would be needed to determine if the current mix of cultivated fields and woodlands reflects the farm's historic, historic period. Pawnee Prospect began as a one and a half story house built circa 1790. Peter Evans, a builder and original owner of Rocky Mount Mills, purchased the house in 1809. Evans added a second story and in 1820, this two story front block was built. Piney Prospect was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 1971. And this is at the original site. Several years after it was listed in the National Register, Piney Prospect sat unoccupied and deteriorating until the owner, wanting the house gone from his land, donated it to Preservation North Carolina in 2005. And here are some photos of the interior taken in the 1980s. During the years the house was vacant, vandals removed some pieces, including some of the mantles and crown molding in the parlor. In late 2005, in order to save the house from demolition, PNC sold it to Sharon and Bob Foster with the stipulation that it be moved and restored. The Fosters moved the house a quarter mile to the south in 2006 onto 44 acres. Uh, the top red circle is its original location and then quarter mile to the south is its current location. It remains on Colonial Road with its original orientation facing west and with a similar setback from the highway. Beginning in 2006, the Fosters began restoring the house with the help of Dean Redrick. 
When PNC sold the house to the Fosters, they gave the couple a long list of significant elements that had to be preserved in order for them to take ownership. All of these elements have been restored and preserved. They include the main stair and all its features, wainscoting and molded baseboards in the main parlor and stair hall, the federal mantle in the main parlor, panel doors and window surrounds in the parlor and stair hall, flat panel wainscoting in the 1790 part of the house, this reeded doorway, archway on the right in the second floor of the original house, original hand grain wood and original door hardware. Before the move, this north elevation seen here included several additions. Those have been removed and the elevation restored. An original chimney is to the west, to the right, and along with six over six and nine over nine windows that have been restored. The other chimney on this elevation was built to match the original. After the house was moved in 2006, the owner built a hyphen seen here on the left, this is the back of the hyphen, to connect a one-story side gabled addition on the north side of the rear shed room. That addition, and this is the back of that addition, dates to 2007-2008. An enclosed porch on the rear of the 1790 section, not original to the house, was removed and this one-story hipped roof L was built and it contains a modern kitchen. And here's an overall scheme of the house showing the dates of its major components. When Piney Prospect was moved in 2006, it was removed from the National Register. We believe it's now eligible under Criterion C for architecture. Criterion consideration B applies because it is a building removed from its original location but which is significant primarily for its architectural value. Around 1830, Elizabeth and Job Pitt built a two-story single pile dwelling with a side gable roof, nine over nine windows, six panel doors, and single shoulder end chimneys. Inside, the original house contains intact and especially rich federal finishes, such as these two mantles, the parlor wainscoting retains grain panels and a band of reading. Early moldings have been preserved over the original door. In 1898, Elizabeth and Job Pitt's grandson, Robert Pitt, added this two-story Queen Anne-inspired addition to the front of the federal dwelling. The addition included a wraparound porch, sawn decoration, and bracketed eaves. The connection between the houses is seamless on the interior. Here's a view from the circa 1830 house into the center hall of the 1898 house. Here's another view of that center hall. The late 19th century house includes typical mantles and other finishes, including this archway on the upper level central passage. A kitchen, once, which once stood apart from the house, was attached to the east end of the original house. The smokehouse stands in the backyard and a frame pump house also is in the rear yard. The Pitt family cemetery containing about 30 marked graves is northwest of the dwelling. Historically, the farm produced cotton and tobacco and currently produces sweet potatoes, cotton and grains. The property is now occupied by Albert Ray Pitt Jr., a sixth generation Pitt and his wife Gwen. The Pitt house is eligible under Criterion C as an intact representative of two distinct architectural expressions, the federal and the Queen Anne. This excellent and intact example of the craftsman style was built for Julia Barry Taylor and Flo Lovelace around 1925. They used lumber from the local Lovelace sawmill operated by Flo's brother, Ed Lovelace, on a parcel behind the Crossroads stores in Crisp. Flo was a merchant farmer, in the words of his granddaughter, who lives in the house now, and ran the crisp cash store at the crossroads and oversaw farming on land north of the village on Highway 258. Flo was active in the community and a founder of the Crisp Power Company in 1924, which also established the community's first water system. The water tower was installed on the back of this parcel, and you will see that later in the slideshow. The deep bracketed boxed eaves and hipped roof, along with the hipped dormer to vent the roof, are among the components of the craftsman style seen on this four square. The single story wings that flank the house 
hold a sunroom on one side and a port cochere on the other, with French doors providing egress. There are interior brick chimneys, a single story rear wing has a partially enclosed porch on one end and an enclosed room, likely a pantry on the other end. The exterior features weatherboards and original nine over one sash set singly and in pairs. This porch detail is original and brings a distinctive touch. There's a garage in the rear yard from the same period with a lodging room at the back where a household employee sometimes stayed in the early 20th century. Interior doors have five horizontal panels and feature original crystal knobs. A stair is enclosed behind a French door in the living room and features a matchstick balustrade with square posts and a square newel capped with molding. Original mantles for the coal burning fireplaces survive in all three bedrooms. Even the few alterations to the house may have achieved significance in their own right. Dentilated crown molding and Georgian style mantles were installed in the living room and dining room in 1966 to celebrate the 50th wedding anniversary of Julia and Flo. The millwork was produced in a building we also surveyed in CRISP, a frame workshop attached to the CRISP Electrical Co-op building, which has been altered. The millwork was produced by William Lovelace, a nephew for the couple. We are recommending the house to the study list under Criterion C in the area of architecture. This hipped roof American Foursquare was the home of Bryant W. Thorpe Sr. He bought the land in January 1910 and likely built the house soon after. Thorpe lived here as a widower with his five sons and a daughter. Bryant Thorpe served in the North Carolina House of Representatives from Edgecombe County in 1885-86. He was one of two black members that session. In the 1885 session, he was appointed to two committees, the Committee on Railroads, Post Roads, and Turnpikes, and the Committee on the Institution for the Deaf and Dumb and Blind. We know from journals of the House of Representatives that he was an active member proposing bills and amendments, including an amendment that would have allowed the voters of Edgecombe County to decide whether they wanted a fence law. Bryant W. Thorpe Sr. is significant as one of a group of Black Edgecombe County residents to serve in the North Carolina General Assembly in the period after Reconstruction and before 1900, the year when a state constitutional amendment disenfranchised most Black voters in North Carolina. From 1868 to 1900, Black residents who were a majority in Edgecombe County were able to hold a variety of public offices from the local to the national level, thanks to their residency in what became known as the Second District, a Black majority coalition of counties that included Edgecombe. From 1870 to 1900, Edgecombe sent 12 Black representatives to the House versus 14 white representatives. The county had six Black senators and six white senators during that period. Everything changed for Black residents after the amendment went into effect in 1901. The Bryant W. Thorpe Senior House is significant in the areas of politics, government, and Black, Black ethnic heritage under Criterion B for its association with Representative Thorpe. Although he had the house built after his tenure in Raleigh, it is the only known historic building associated with him. We were not able to access the interior, but the intact nature of the exterior might indicate an intact interior. And we are not nominating the house for its architecture, but only for its important connection with Thorpe. And the house is eligible under Criterion B. This two-story, circa 1915, neoclassical-style dwelling is on East Main Street in Whitakers. The house was apparently built by Jesse and W.T. Broswell in 1910, who lived in a similarly fine house next door, and sold to D.B. Gaskill in 1919 for $5,500. Gaskill was the cashier at the Bank of Whitakers, according to the 1920 federal census. A double height porch over a single story wraparound porch characterizes the neoclassical style and full height gabled bays are at side elevations. There are interior brick chimneys with corbelled caps and windows are one over one sash. Classically derived details include Tuscan columns at both porches, pedimented gables with dental molding. There's a single story a gabled wing at the rear, along with some additions and alterations 
including a rear porch stair that goes to the second story. Inside, there is stained glass, paneled wainscot, and a lot of details that look like they could have come from the Sears catalog. This house, the Broswell house next door, and a few others on the block are really great early 20th century Queen Anne style dwellings, but we could not get permission for interior documentation at most of them, despite multiple requests. The houses all are, however, in the study listed Whitaker's district. We recommend adding the Broswell Gaskin Gaskill House to the study list individually for its significance under criterion C in the area of architecture. This 1950 ranch house is of rusticated concrete block built by first owner R. Waverly Lucas for himself and his wife, Viola Sessions Lucas. The couple had married in 1942. He was blind, at least for a good portion of his adult life. Lucas had been born into a farming family in 1910 in Halifax. In 1920, he was living with his parents and attending school, apparently locally and not at the state school for the blind and deaf. So he seems to still be cited in this period. Likewise, in 1930, he was 19 years old and living in Edgecombe County with his father and working as a farm laborer. In 1947, he and Viola purchased this land. He was blind at this time, according to the current owner. She reports that Lucas made all the block for the house with a small machine on site and used salvaged windows, doors, and trim from houses in the area that were being demolished. Lucas worked with assistants who carried out tasks according to his direction. They added the back wing to the house in 1970 when his ailing brother moved in with him. And also from about 1950 to perhaps as late as 1985, Lucas operated the Lucas Concrete Works out of a workshop on the property, making concrete septic tanks, concrete block, bird baths, and possibly other concrete items. Here's his business signpost rendered in concrete and metal pipe at the side yard of the house. South and southeast of the house is a collection of nine outbuildings, notably including the workshop of Lucas Concrete Works, which is the largest building in the rear yard. Here's the workshop building. You can see there's a steel I-beam protruding at the center of the roof line. There's a winch inside that slides along the beam to move the larger concrete products. And here are some of the smaller outbuildings. Additionally, Lucas wove baskets and made canes and two buildings that he used for these purposes also survive on the site. Other outbuildings include storage and equipment sheds, a garage, and a chicken house. Most are unchanged or perhaps some plywood doors have been added. Also notable is a concrete path that snakes around these buildings. You can see it here behind this red shed with the salvage door. Lucas laid the path as an accessibility accommodation. He tapped a cane on the concrete to direct himself to various buildings and back to the workshop. Note the concrete bird bath here. We are recommending this complex under criterion C in the area of architecture. We saw a number of concrete block houses in the county and many mentions of concrete block for building in the Rocky Mount paper. We saw examples in Kanita, Pine Tops, here outside of Leggett, and in rural areas. The Lucas Place was a great example of concrete block construction, but also the small-scale concrete products manufacturing business. It may also be eligible under Criterion A in the areas of social history and commerce. I don't think Lucas attended the State School for the Blind and the Deaf, but he did attend the Lions Club camp for people with disabilities and may have received training from the Lions also. So there may be a connection with social welfare initiatives to help the blind in North Carolina. This is one of the best craftsman bungalows we saw in the county and definitely one of the more intact houses in Macclesfield. The house is rich with architectural detail and impressively intact at the exterior, although there is a large gabled addition to the rear elevation, but there's also a great garage from the 1920s. The exterior of the house is brick with shingles at the gable ends and this nice bracketed bay at the center with nine over one sash. Pairs and trios of squared columns with raised panels stand on concrete capped brick piers to support the outside edge of the porch gable. A flat roofed side porch on the east elevation connects to the front porch with a continuous terracotta tile floor so that the corner of the wraparound is an open patio. 
Windows at the facade's first story under the porch roof are trios of eight over one craftsman sash flanking the partially glazed front door that is surrounded by transom and side lights. At the west elevation, a shed roofed projecting bay has a trio of windows with a 15 light fixed sash flanked by taller eight over one craftsman windows. Here's the interior view of the grouping. The interior features beaded wainscot in a few rooms and mantles are of wood with craftsman or colonial elements and may have been ordered from a catalog. The stair is open stringer and appears to have a balustrade with squared pickets. There's a brick mantle in the living room with a later molded, molded shelf. We propose adding this house to the study list under criterion C in the area of architecture. On April 7, 1970, Charlotte and Bobby Ray Edmiston bought five acres outside Tarboro in order to build a house following the plans for a Cape Cod they found in a publication called Better Homes and Gardens Home Building Ideas 1967. The plans architect, William M. Thompson, was a Yale graduate who worked as the resident architect at Colonial Williamsburg in the late 1960s. The Edmonstons hired builder Shorty Ellis to construct the house, which was completed in 1970. The plan suggests using old brick as the surface for the outdoor patio. Bobby Ray Edmonston located vintage late 19th century Silas Lucas bricks from Wilson and built the patty, patio himself on weekends and after work during the work week. An iron fence was salvaged from a cemetery in Falkland, and it encloses that brick patio on the west side. Salvage brick was also used for the paths on the east side of the house. The interior, as seen in these photos taken by the homeowner, remains intact. Beams used in the den, pictured on the right, came from a tobacco warehouse in Wilson. Two log tobacco barns stand in the rear yard. Both were shortened and moved to their sites in the 70s and 80s. A pack house in the foreground was fashioned into a country store by the Edmistons. The Edmiston House is significant under Criterion C for architecture as an intact plan book house from 1970. The house attests to the intense ad admiration of early American architecture in the late 60s and early 1970s. The Lawrence Etheridge House is an intact Queen Anne style dwelling built in the late 19th century and expanded around 1900. What makes the house especially notable is that very few Queen Anne houses survive in rural Edgecombe. This is the rear of the house. The vernacular one-story house with complex massing has, at its heart, a simple hip roof cottage with a rear L. This long front wing with canted corners and a wraparound porch pictured here was added at the turn of the 20th century. Here's an overall uh, of the form. On the left is the front wing, in the center is the hip roof cottage, and then the L on the right. The house has a central passage plan and includes intact and carefully restored finishes, doors, and windows. The house was owned by the Lawrence and Etheridge families, and the current owner acquired it in 1990. The house once stood at, a, at the center of a cotton, tobacco, and peanut farm. Unfortunately, the cotton gin and packet house were lost in a hurricane but a wood garage and wood chicken house remain. A peanut drying barn is just outside the current parcel line, but was historically associated with the farm. The significance of the Lawrence Etheridge House is as an intact and thoughtfully restored late 19th, turn of the 20th century Queen Anne House. There are many hip roof cottages remaining in rural Edgecombe County, but houses with symmetrically massed Queen Anne houses are unusual and speak to the Lawrence family's expanding status as farmers at the turn of the century. The house appears eligible under C for architecture. Now we're going to present agricultural resources. The Anderson Farm Rural Historic District includes the Anderson Farm, the house is pictured at the top right, the Anderson Grocery, and the Anderson Cotton Gin seen at the bottom picture. They're all located along Drawn Road near Leggett, and the cotton gin is at the north, and the grocery at the south, and the farm in the middle. The two-story weatherboard house at the center of the Anderson Farm dates to 1887. It retains a bracketed cornice, original siding, and intricate porch detail. It has a center hall plan and a rear L. The interior retains its original finishes. 
The complex around the house retains an impressive collection of late 19th and early 20th century outbuildings seen in this 1960 aerial photograph. Most prominent is this bell tower. An 1887 tenant house stands on the north side of the complex. Other outbuildings include weatherboard chicken buildings, a stock barn, and smokehouse. Directly behind the house is a metal-sided pack house, a front gable garage, a side gabled equipment shed, a side gabled board and batten workshop. An open sided 1970s peanut shed is farther to the south. In the 70s, the Anderson family processed peanuts for the Anderson Talbot Peanut Company in Leggett. Just to the south of the farm is the circa 1880 Anderson Grocery. Nearly all the windows have been shuttered or enclosed with boards, but it appears the original six over six sash remain in at least some of these bays. A set of wooden stairs on the south of the elevation leads to the upper story where Dr. J.H. Anderson practiced medicine. A small 19th century building stands behind the store. Dr. Anderson used it as his medical office before the store was built. The office was moved before 1945 from the farm to its current location and it was later expanded to serve as a dwelling. A late 19th century cotton gin, once part of the Anderson farm, stands on a separate parcel to the northeast of the farm at the north end of this small district. The farm and store passed down through the family and is now owned by a fourth generation Anderson, Doc David G. Anderson Jr. and his wife, Johnetta. The Anderson Farm Rural Historic District is potentially eligible under criteria A and C in the areas of agriculture, commerce, and architecture. The Barlow Mayo Farm consists of three separate complexes on a 989 acre tract northeast of Princeville. At the north end is a modern collection of farm structures, farm structured picture on the left, including grain bins, pole sheds, sheltering metal peanut wagons, and a mid 20th century house. And those are at the, the two northern locations on this map. This map shows the location of those two modern complexes north of the main farmyard. The significant part of this farm is the main complex that includes the circa 1840 Arthur Barlow House. There are additions from the 50s and 80s and the porch has been altered. However, numerous outbuildings and landscape features from the 19th and 20th centuries remain, including extensive pecan and wal walnut groves in front of the house. Behind the house is a brick spring house, plank barn, dairy house, and garage. To the east is this workshop with the bell structure on top and a plank smokehouse. These two barns, one's concrete block and the other has a barge, has barge board along its cornice or northeast of the house. Here's that same barn uh, along with a board and batten shed. This is a view of the cotton gin and behind it, a saddle notch log cabin. The farm's largest barn has a huge loft and side sheds. New additions to the complex include modern tractor sheds east of the house. Arthur Barlow bought 600 acres between 1832 and 1845 and built that main house. In 1881, Benjamin Mayo bought the property, which became known as Piney Grove Farm. In the 1920s, his son, also named Benjamin Mayo, an officer with Mayo Mills in Tarboro, ran the farm, which focused on livestock and at times racehorses. The farm remains in the Mayo family and appears eligible under A and C for agriculture and architecture. Three generations of the Gorham family developed this nearly 100 acre farm, mostly in the first half of the 20th century. Minnie and Charlie Gorham built a one-story L-plan house with weatherboard siding around 1900. Not many years later, the family added another front gable wing and an additional kitchen on the south side. This expansion accommodated Minnie and Charles' son, son and daughter-in-law, Tom and Ethel Gorham, who moved in after their 1950 wedding. Once expanded, the family built a porch across the front between the two front gable wings. That porch is missing and windows have been boarded up, but the corbelled brick chimneys, original siding and brick foundation piers remain. As I mentioned, after Ethel and Thomas married, 
They lived at and worked on the farm to help his mother, who was widowed in 1945. Ethel Gorham's grandfather, James Murphy Lamb, had founded Sunnyside Floral Nursery in Fayetteville in 1873, so the younger Gorhams christened the farm Sunnyside Farm. From her family's nurse, nursery, Ethel acquired eastern hemlock and deodar cedar saplings and planted one of each in front of the house. Those trees now tower over the house. Together, Minnie and Charles, Thomas and Ethel, and Thomas's brother William worked the farm producing hogs, Angus beef cattle, tobacco, peanuts, and other crops to feed the family. The adults expected the children and grandchildren, including current owner Susan Gorham Hayes, to work on the farm. Susan Hayes reports that the only job she and her sister were not allowed to do was the castrating. In the 1960s, Ethel and Thomas built themselves a new modern brick ranch house. They raised their daughters there and welcomed extended family for social gatherings. The old house was abandoned, but not forgotten. The variety of outbuildings on Sunnyside Farm speaks to the range of agricultural activities in which the Gorham family engaged. They employed tenant workers to help with the farm, so they built not only tenant houses, two of those survive, but also a commissary pictured here on the right. That building remains and was later expanded to include a workshop. Two tobacco barns and a pack house remain from the period when Brightleaf was grown and processed. The circa 1940 terracotta flu curing barn is likely the best preserved example of its type in the county. Just to the east is a flu curing barn with an attached looping shed. On the south side of the farm is a pack house later used to keep hog feed and for storage. Other outbuildings include a peanut grinding shed, a circa 1950 long barn that contains a well and well house, a cattle combine shelter, and a smokehouse. Sunnyside Farm is an outstanding example of a 20th century complex displaying a range of buildings, structures, and landscape features common on Edgecombe County farms. It appears eligible under criteria A and C for agriculture and architecture. Afi Davenport likely built this cotton gin in the 1930s as a family farm cotton gin, as opposed to a community gin. The two-story rectangular building includes, includes a raised platform on the front where cotton could be unloaded from the upper level. Cotton was unloaded from wagons on the north elevation where a shed roof is supported by wood posts. The shed roof projection on the south elevation held the seed room. The L provided shelter for machinery. Edgecombe County remained a major producer of cotton into the 20th century, but smaller gins like the Davenport gin have become rare. After World War II, a lar large community gins took over. The Davenport gin is eligible under Criterion A for agriculture and industry and for, under C as an example of an intact Depression era cotton gin. We didn't see anything like this 100 foot long frame gambrel roofed cattle barn anywhere in the county. The barn has side sheds along both eave walls and the east gambrel end is accessible from an unpaved farm lane. The main section is two stories tall and 50 feet wide. Side sheds are 18 feet deep. This barn is enormous. The center gable gambrel section has two open aisles down its center flanked by animal pens and storage cabinets. Braced timbers standing on concrete piers provide support for the second floor and are most visible between the two aisles. The posts are reinforced in some places with creosote logs. A wood stair along the south wall of the east aisle rises to the loft above. Two window openings at the loft have aluminum storms in them only. But original windows pierce the side of the barn at the second story in the area between the gambrel eave and the top of the shed roof. There, eight six over six double hung sash windows are installed sideways so that the windows are opened by sliding the sash from side to side rather than up or down. Aluminum siding covers the original weatherboard sheathing of the barn, some of which is visible at the east end of the building. The barn stands on a 228 acre parcel identified in the Edgecombe County GIS website as W.H. Killebrew land. The system dates the barn to 1901, but folks living in the house next door noted that the barn was built in the 1930s and managed at some point in the 20th century by H. Cofield Robbins. Robbins' father, John Robbins, 
helped to build the barn, according to a family member who lives in the Gambrel roofed house on the neighboring parcel. The survey informant stated that there was no connection between that house and the barn. We recommend the barn for the study list for its significance under criterion A in the area of agriculture. Clark Industries peanut processing and buying facility occupies seven acres just outside Princeville. Edgecombe County was one of the top peanut producers in the state throughout the 20th century, but especially from the 1930s into the 1970s. This peanut processing and buying facility retains 13 buildings and structures used in peanut processing and storage in the mid to late 20th century. Building and, structure, and structures include this office sheathed in corrugated metal. To the south is the two-part corrugated metal elevator on tall wooden posts. It's attached to a shed roof building. The taller section was used for loading trucks with peanuts. Large metal-sided warehouses are at the rear of the complex. Open-sided buildings where the peanuts are dried and stored in wagons occupies the east side of the complex. They are fitted with large fans to dry the nuts. Original peanut wagons remain sheltered by these buildings. William Grimes Clark of Tarboro started Clark Industries, a diversified build business involved in agriculture and finance in 1955. In 1962, Catherine and Romaine Howard sold the parcel outside Princeville to Clark Industries. The property was a small portion of Oak Spring Farm, an expansive property George Howard purchased in 1869. In 1972, Catherine and Romaine Howard sold an adjacent parcel to Clark Industries for an expansion that happened in 1972 when the company added a dumping pit and machine machinery to unload peanuts. Peanuts were a significant 20th century crop processed locally for market. Few of these properties retain such a diverse diverse range of structures as the Clark Industries peanut facility. It appears eligible under criterion A for agriculture and industry. There is another peanut processing complex in Battleboro, which comprises this large warehouse with monitor, a huge silo and elevator, and office buildings and sheds on a triangular parcel of land near the rail line. This parcel was owned by peanut farmer Henry Milgram and his wife Ruby Milgram from 1957 through the 1970s. Milgram was also, according to a Rocky Mount Telegram article, a former state senator, past president of the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, and a Nash County business and civic leader. The county GIS system dates the warehouse and office to 1960. The other buildings appear to have a placeholder date of 1900, but more likely date to 1960 or later. Today, the complex is owned by Battleboro Produce, a Rocky Mount based agricultural company that grows, packages, ships, and exports sweet potatoes. We recommend adding the property to the study list for its significance under criterion A in the area of agriculture and industry. Now we move on to community buildings. Grace Episcopal Church, built in 1894 in the Lawrence community, is an intact Gothic Revival style framed church established as a mission of Calvary Episcopal Church of Tarboro. The German sided chapel retains all of its original exterior features and an especially intact and beautiful interior of exposed wood and pivoting stained glass windows. A cemetery with gravestones dating from 1897 to 2018 surrounds the chapel. The 1894 Grace Episcopal Church, with a high degree of architectural integrity, possesses significance in the areas of history of religion for its role as a rural mission church starting in the late 19th century and for its embodiment of the vernacular Gothic Revival style. The church does not hold regular services, but hosts homecoming events once a year and other special events. It meets criterion, criterion consideration A as a religious property deriving primary significance from its architectural distinction or historical importance. In 1876, El Elder Abraham Wooten organized the Radiku Baptists, an independent denomination of black worshipers who sought to establish churches not under the control of white churches. Formerly enslaved and a Union Army veteran, Wooten was ordained in 1878. He then founded three Radicu Primitive Baptist churches in the county, including this one, Few in Number Primitive Baptist Church. The church was built near the rural community of Wiggins around 1890. 
Members from Tarboro often took the East Carolina Railway to Daviston and walked a half mile to attend. In 1953, the church had 118 members, the largest congregation in the 13 member Bethlehem Primitive Baptist Association, and it retains an active congregation. The interior retains its original finishes and original plan. A concrete block addition built in the 1960s extends from the rear. And here is the interior. It serves as a kitchen for the church. Few in number, Primitive Baptist Church is significant as an example of a late 19th century rural church building with elements of the Gothic revival style. It is also significant in the area of religion and Black ethnic heritage as an example of a Primitive Baptist Church organized by Black worshipers who sought to separate themselves from the white church following the Civil War. It meets criterion considering it consideration A as a religious property deriving significance from its architectural distinction or historical importance. This one room school building was built in the 1880s near Mayo's Crossroads for white students. It was replaced with another building around 1912 and was moved at some point to the nearby Mayo farm where it stands today. The one room front gabled building has weatherboard siding, metal roofing, and a brick stack. There is a steeply pitched roof on a box cornice, five panel entry door at the gable end, batten side door, and six over six and six over one sash. The brick stack above the roof line survives, but the interior section and the central stove it vented, which was documented in an earlier survey, is gone. Interior walls and ceilings are sheathed in wood. The aluminum storms are likely salvaged from another building and do not fit the openings here. A shed porch at the gabled facade is a later addition constructed of plain squared timbers and metal roofing. The, this is the only 19th century school we located and the only one room schoolhouse. We recommend adding this one to the study list under criterion C in the area of architecture as an example of the one room schoolhouse. It meets criteria consideration B for a moved property deriving significance in the area of architecture. The circa 1915 former busy workers school stands northwest of speed. The building is in ex excellent condition, retaining weatherboard siding, brick chimneys, and the distinct pair of front gabled porches with turn posts on each end of a pair of interior cloak rooms. The oversized windows on the side elevations have been restored. The interior retains its original tongue and groove walls, ceilings, and wainscoting, wood floors, six panel doors with working transoms, and 14 foot ceilings. Although now fixed in place for safety, the roll down wall between the former classrooms is original and retains the metal handle used to move it up and down. An original wood privy stands in the rear yard. The school design closely follows plan number two in Plans for Public Schoolhouses, a plan book produced by Raleigh architects Barrett and Thompson for the North Carolina State Superintendent of Public Instruction. The superintendent's office published the booklets from 1903 to 1914 to provide local school boards with plans and specs for constructing schools that would meet requirements set out by the state. Every element of the buildings from their site what direction they should face, the material to use, and sanitation standards were included in the plan books. In the 1920s, following countywide school consolidation, the school was converted to a dwelling. In the 1960s, it was used for farm storage. In 2008, Daniel Sensi, whose ancestor bought the building in the 1920s, began restoring the school. He based the exterior paint color on remnants he found under the gable eaves. The interior functions as a dwelling, but some clues as to its origins remain. For example, graffiti left by students remains on the foyer wall. Busy Workers School appears eligible under Criterion A for its significance in the area of education on the local level and under C as an outstanding and intact example of a schoolhouse built following a pattern book issued by the North Carolina State Superintendent of Public Instru Instruction in the early 20th century. The circa 1960 Canita Barbecue Building stands behind the 1955 concrete block Canita Community Building near the heart of this tiny railroad community. This photo shows the buildings with the barbecue building in front. 
The Barbecue Club was established in 1960, and as recently as 2019, there was a schedule of members who'd signed up to cook in 11 of 12 months of the year. I surveyed this building in 2020 during lockdown, and I'm betting that they're using it again. The Barbecue Club is a single-story rectangular plan structure with half-height walls of brick under light frame walls with screens rather than sheathing. A gabled monitor with screened eave walls caps the roof. Both roofs have exposed rafter tails and metal roofing. A broad chimney rises along the west gable end of the building, and two single leaf screen doors are at the north eave wall. A poured concrete floor is at the interior with center rectangular sand pit under the barbecue and two long prep and serving tables. A butcher block stands in one corner and a bottle opener is affixed to a door frame. The concrete block community building dates to 1955. It was previously owned by the Canito Ruritan Club and seems to have been used, seems to have been built by an independent group called the Canito Community Project. Trustees included local business owners. The interior consists of one large gathering room under the main roof and restrooms and a kitchen in the shed roofed back room. Windows have been replaced. We recommend adding the property to the study list under criterion A in the area of recreation. The sign in front of this one-story windowless concrete block building indicates the Panola Heights Club was founded in 1950. In 1972, W.S. Clark & Sons, a retail biz business that operated in Tarboro for about 100 years, sold the one-acre parcel to the Panola Heights Club Incorporated for $10. Since its construction, the club has served as a social and civic gathering place for Black residents of Tarboro and the surrounding area. It is named for a historically black neighborhood in East Tarboro. Open-sided gable roof picnic sh shelters occupy the rear yard. The interior has concrete block walls and new tile floor. Organized black social clubs have existed in North Carolina since at least the 1890s when the Asheville Colored Club was founded. The Hollywood Club formed in 1916 in Rocky Mount is the oldest known black social club in Eastern North Carolina. It supported the Red Cross, the Boy Scouts and the YMCA. In 1959, the Young Men's Social Club in Rocky Mount purchased uniforms for the Booker T. Washington High School cheerleaders. These clubs were social, but members were also involved in the civil rights movement and the clubs typically had a philanthropic mission as well. In the mid-20th century, clubs existed in Burlington, Roxborough, Washington, Laurenburg, and Winston-Salem. Unfortunately, we haven't learned many specifics about the workings of the Panola Heights Social Club. It formed in 1950, a time in Edgecombe when white clubs would not have allowed Black members, and the building dates to 1972, the year the county schools integrated, two facts that tie it to the civil rights era in the county. Based on Edgecombe County's history as a Black majority county in the 20th century and the fact that no other mid-20th century Black clubs could be identified, we believe that this club appears eligible under Criterion A in the areas of social history and Black ethnic heritage. When the East Carolina Railroad was established around here in 1900, a few farmers moved to their sawmills to the spot to facilitate building. What evolved was the town of Pine Tops, highly dependent on the early mills for, their, for its physical development. Those early sawmills have long since been replaced with commercial development along Hamlet Street, but at the north edge of town, a mid 20th century sawmilling complex survives. It includes sheds that sheltered the milling machinery, a large storage building, and two other gabled structures, perhaps including an office. Irene Kraft inherited this land after 1930. She subdivided it and sold two portions to J.T. Weaver in 1949. The federal census notes that John T. Weaver owned and operated a sawmill in 1950 and lived in Pine Tops with his wife and school aged son. He had previously worked as a mechanic and as a school teacher. We recommend this complex for the study list for its significance under criterion A in the area of industry. Macclesfield is another town created by the 20th century East Carolina Railway, which was built by incarcerated workers. This tiny two cell jail postdates the construction period of the rail line, but it certainly is a continuation of the town's origin story. The shed roofed brick building has a parapet roof, 
windows in the front third of the side elevations, and a single leaf entry centered on the facade. There is a concrete floor and a small heating stove in the southwest corner of the building. The lighted front third of the building is separated from the back two thirds by a metal partition wall. One over one window sash or missing glass and the style and rail single leaf door with ceramic knob is deteriorating, but all the materials appear to be original. Both the window and the door openings are reinforced with metal security grates. Cell doors are riveted metal lattice set on strap hinges. Here's the latch. And here's one of the two cells. A local history notes that this is the second jail to function in the town built around 1925 after the first jail burned down. The iron door and iron window bars are salvaged from the first jail and reused here. We recommend this building for its for the study list for its significance under criterion A in the area of law. CRISP's local power company also established a water system for the farming community east of Macclesfield around 1950, alleviating dependence on well water for the first time. The system operated on its own until 1979 when CRISP's system merged with the county system with the assistance of grant funds from housing and urban development Prior to the merger, the CRISP system and another small area system had been serving 74 households. There is now a modern tank standing nearby, but the elevated wood tank from about 1950 remains. At the foot of the tower is a gabled pump house overgrown with volunteer tree growth. We recommend this property for the study list for its significance under criterion A in the area of community planning and development. Established in 1865 and incorporated in 1885, Princewell, Princeville was the first independently governed African American town in the U.S. Throughout Princeville's history, the Tar River, which flows along its north and west borders, has flooded the town repeatedly. Major floods occurred in 1919, 1924, 1940, and 1958. In 1965, the Army Corps of Engineers built a two and a half mile long dike along the Tar River to protect Princeville from flooding. In September 1999, floodwaters resulting from Hurricane Floyd compromised the dike and Princeville was inundated. 15 to 20 feet of floodwaters submerged the town's commercial and residential areas for nearly two weeks. Repeated floods have washed away buildings, including those on this slide and the next, or caused severe damage resulting in the demolition or removal of family homes, outbuildings, and commercial and institutional buildings. The built landscape of Princeville contains few historic buildings and most older structures have been substantially renovated using FEMA funding following Hur Hurricane Floyd. The overwhelming majority of the material culture that would otherwise depict the history of the town of Princeville has been lost. Of the 92 buildings documented before our project, 70 no longer stand. The 17 buildings remaining have been altered with vinyl siding and replacement windows. There are two significant historic buildings in town, Principal School, which is listed in the National Register and built in the late 30s, according to plans from the Rosenwald Fund through the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, and the 1871 Mount Zion Primitive Baptist Church, which was put on the study list in 2001. In addition, the Princeville baptismal site where black churches in Princeville and Tarboro baptized their members between the 1890s and the 1950s is a significant site and has been determined eligible for listing through the environmental review process. Because of the loss of historic fabric in the town, we are proposing the Princeville Community Cemetery for the study list. It spans over 14 acres with earthen lanes set in grid pattern to allow access between groups of burials set mostly in neat rows. Stones range from concrete tablets carved by hand to professionally created marble or concrete tablets or ledgers. Some family groups are contained by wrought iron, chain link, and wood post fences or low concrete block and brick walls. Princeville Cemetery includes the community burial yard as well as the Kearney, Wilson, Dancy, and Memorial Cemeteries. It also contains the graves of Elder Abraham Wooten and Turner Prince, the man for whom the town is named. 
Princeville Cemetery appears potentially eligible for the National Register in the area of community planning and development, ethnic heritage, and social history, all under Criterion A. In this case, Criterion Consideration D applies since the cemetery derives its significance from its association with historic events. In making this recommendation, we are following the guidance of our National Register reviewer, Jim Gabbert, who, at our last National Register Consultants Workshop, advised that when, that when so much has been lost in a single community, a cemetery could be potentially eligible for listing. We will now move on to conservation resources. The construction of drainage canals to improve farming and forestry occurred throughout the 19th century in North Carolina. In the late 19th century, drainage districts were organized across Eastern North Carolina to build and maintain canals. The North Carolina Drainage Association held, held its first convention in New Bern in 1908. Congress, Congressman John Small of Washington, North Carolina drafted the North Carolina Drainage Act that passed the legislature in 1909 to encourage and support canal building among farmers. As a result, organized drainage projects began, began to increase as farmers and local officials recognized the importance of land improvement. Agricultural drainage became the focus of much attention among farmers and politicians in Edgecombe County in the late 19th century, especially in the southeastern part of the county near Kanita. On November 29, 1894, an article promoting drainage in the Tarboro Southerner newspaper provided provided two advantages to the practice. First, it allowed surplus water to run off the land quickly so that the soil could be tilled very soon after heavy rains. Also, drainage helped ret to retain necessary moisture in the soil by alleviating hard, compact clay. Individual farms were drained into the canals, which led to Kanita Creek, which eventually dumped into the Tar River. At least three canals remain in the Kanita Creek watershed, but the best preserved is the Balahack Canal. It orig originates on the north side of Robertson School Road, east of Tarboro. This is the northern part. Here's the central part. It extends a total of about six and a half miles southward and flows into, the Can into Kanita Creek, just south of the town of Kanita, and eventually into the Tar River. The exact date of construction remains unknown. A canal about the same location as the Balahat Canal appears on this Confederate Engineering Bureau map from around 1865. The first mention of it in a local newspaper came in 1922 when the Daily Southerner reported on a meeting of the Balahat Canal Company of Kanita. A barbecue dinner was served at the meeting where C.B. Keach was elected president and Calvin Warren secretary and treasurer. Treasurer. Four other men were elected to the committee, which had charge of making the necessary assessments and cleaning out the canal. Canals became and remain essential to productive farming in southeastern Edgecombe County. The Balahat Canal, the best preserved of these structures, appears eligible under Criterion A in the areas of conservation and agriculture. The last two properties are presented together and they are the Edgecombe Fire Lookout Tower and the Fountain Fire Lookout Tower. In 1925, the North Carolina Department of Conservation and Development was established and, in, and by 1927, the department had constructed its first fire lookout tower. 71 towers had been built by 1936 with additional towers constructed by the Park Service and the U.S. Forest Service to protect federal land. In the 1990s, the Division of Forestry had moved away from the use of fire towers in favor of more modern methods of detection. Edgecombe County fell within District 5, which covered a large area of eastern North Carolina that stretched from Northampton and Halifax counties at the northeast to Orange County to the west. Each county had its own forest ranger, fire lookout towers, and firefighters, and each county operated separately but could communicate with personnel in other counties. The Edgecombe Fire Lookout Tower, just outside Tarboro, built in 1932, was the main tower for the county. The operator at Tarboro radioed the other tower attendants in the county four times a day to provide fire danger ratings. If danger was low, the towers were not manned. 
If the fire danger reached a certain level, the tower attendant remained in the tower until the danger passed. When a fire was spotted, the attendant obtained a compass reading for its location and then radioed the firefighters who responded to the blaze. Besides the tower at Tarboro, the other, only other fire tower remaining in the county is the Fountain Fire Tower in the southern part of Edgecombe, likely built in the 1940s. Both towers are four-sided, truss-framed structures constructed of heavy galvanized steel members. They stand about 93 feet tall, have an interior stair that rises to an enclosed cabin, and rest on four tapered concrete footers. Horizontal beams reinforce the diagonal truss frame and provide support for the stair, which doubles back and forth. Though the support elements and stair runners are metal, the planar elements of the steps and landings are constructed of wood. Metal handrails also line the stairs, and at some point, metal wire similar to fencing was used to fill in the open space between the steps and handrails. The one-room cabin at the top appears to be made of metal sheets below ribbons of nine light windows. The Edgecombe Fire Lookout Tower and the Fire Lookout and the Fountain Fire Lookout Tower appear eligible for listing under Criterion A in the area of conservation. The end. Okay. Okay, at this point, um, I first want to entertain any discussion, any questions that um, Beth, <laughs> we hope that you can answer. Um, and I open it up to the floor. After we do this round, we'll have a short break. So um, a very short break, but we want to first get this um, property determined or this this um, application determined. So any questions for Beth? I have a couple of questions. Um, I, I can hear you all now, so um, I hope you all can hear me. Um, sorry yes, about we all can. That. Uh, great, great. Uh, and Beth, um, tell us your name. You also need to say your name, even though we can see I'm it. I'm sorry. This is Joe <laughs> Opperman. Thank you, I Joe. Had a, had a couple of questions. One is I noticed in that, I think, advertisement, in the, the newspaper advertisement for the Ballahack Canal Company, it's spelled Ballahack, B-A-L-L-Y, H-A-C-K, as opposed to B-A-L-L-A. -L -L -A. And I didn't know if about the discrepancy from what is on the list here, if, which which spelling is correct. But I did notice that there's a difference between the two spellings. And maybe you're aware of what, what the correct spelling is. In that newspaper article, you're correct that the headline says Bally Hack, but in the text right. of the article, they spell it Bala Hack, like it is on the uh -huh. agenda. So I think it may have been an error that the typesetter made in that particular headline. Okay. Yeah. And then another question I had was, and, and by the way, this is a fascinating group of uh, properties that are reviewed today. I found myself making notes all along thinking about, gee, I really want to go there and take a look or go to that barbecue <laughs> state. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to go to the club. Interesting group, but the the cup, the bell tower and then the building with the bell on the top of it. I'm not real familiar with what those purposes might be. Was that for calling field hands for mills or something of the sort? Or do you know? I don't know. I don't have a great um, concise answer to that. Maybe other people in the committee who have seen these types of resources can chime in. They might, or maybe other staff members might have more ideas. Um, but I just anecdotally, I know um, I'm a native of Halifax County as were my grandparents. And I remember my grandmother talking about uh, being on her grandparents' farm and her grandmother would always ring the bell to bring um, her grandfather and her uncles and whoever was working with them at the time in for the dinner meal in the middle of the day. So. That's one anecdotal idea that I have about um, the potential use for a bell in a in an agricultural setting. I don't. Is, does anyone else have anything to add to that question? Yeah. Good question. I, I, 
the part of the country where um, bells were commonly used, where you had a lot of field hands and uh, and meals were provided to them, and so they rang the bell when they wanted everybody to take a break, and meal or in the day, that sort of thing. Okay, are there any other questions? I do. I do have one. This is Valerie Johnson. Um, I. D- I did notice that Franklinton Center at Bricks was not mentioned as a part of the study list. Was Do you know any reason why? I know it has kind of a mixed um, campus, but it was, it has very, it has some significance in, in different ways. And so there's a school property there. There's old dorms that were used that um, are still used as dorms, and then they have more contemporary uses. So do you have any idea? I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not immediately familiar with this property, Dr. Johnson. Is it, um, would it be one of the old uh, high school campuses, or can you tell me a little bit more? No, it, it was a former plantation. Um, and the United the United Church of Christ it became the um, landowners historically, but they were con- it was the Congregational Church that, after the Civil War, created Franklin Center at Bricks as a school, and it was a high school. It has a dormitories. It actually arranged um, all grades. They have what I would. There's a, another building in the back that is that looks like it might be a Rosenwald. They had a pool. Um, there are also houses for the um, people who took care of the property, the caretakers. It's been used for social justice meetings when Princeville flooded. That was a staging place for um, providing relief to um, community folks. So it it was also one of the places where they announced and first did the, the environmental, the toxic report that was released. Um, so it isn't, it has significance in terms of social justice history, black history, um, how it moved over time in terms of educating um, black folks, even up to college. Um, there, it still has its farmland, so they grow cotton still. Mm-hmm. Um, so it it tells a lot of different stories. It's right off of 301 um, in Whitaker's. And you go back, it's Brick Lane, and it's also was an important part of the United Church of Christ. Now it's its own 503C1. Um, trying to think of what else is there. There, there. there are different buildings that mark the different parts of its history. Thank you. Thank you for helping me with that, Dr. Johnson. Um, that that property is already on the study list. It was okay. added in, I believe, in 1986. Okay, so I wasn't sure. I just wanted to make sure. Oh, thank you. Absolutely no. Thank you. It was resurveyed during the um, during the most recent survey. Okay. Mm-hmm. Cool. Any other questions or comments? So at this point, I'd like to entertain a motion. So moved. So this is Joe Opperman moves to accept the recommend accept the recommendation for the yeah. study list of the Edgecombe County. Right. Is there a second? All oh, second. <laughs> I saw I saw Josie first, so um, thank you so much. It's been moved and seconded. Um, all those can say aye or raise your hand. Um, all those uh, in favor? Dr. Johnson. Oh, Dr. yes, ma'am. Dr. Johnson, I'm sorry because we're virtual. We've got to do the that's... I think by the roll call, if I'm not mistaken. I think Mr. Ruffin. That's my recollection. <laughs> the meetings he chairs like this as well. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Oh, I thought I was getting around something. Okay. So I will call the roll as I did earlier. And um, 
I'll start with those. All those who are in favor, say aye as I call your name. David Bergstone. Aye. David Denard. David Ruffin. Aye. Joe Opperman. Aye. Josie Ward. Aye. Dr. Fitz. Aye. Honorable Clark. Aye. Sean Patch. Aye. Tamara Brothers. Aye. Valerie Ann Johnson. Aye. And do we have any opposed? You'd have to say your name. Okay, well then it has been properly moved, second and voted upon. We have this property, this survey on the study list. Thank you. At this point, five minutes for y'all to take a little break and we'll get set up for the next um, next viewing. So you can come back at 11.28.
we'd like to go ahead and get started um with Ma our next that yes doc, um yes madam chair this is david ruffin uh, uh -huh. point of inquiry uh unfortunately i need to leave this meeting at one around one o'clock or a little later is there any uh presumption if there's a lunch break are we going to try to go through till one o'clock or um relative well, to the, and i and I, obviously i'm concerned about a quorum um to be make sure that that doesn't affect a quorum no that is also we were originally scheduled to go until 12 30 and not have a lunch break um okay okay because Perfect. there are several of us that have to be in Warrington by two o'clock and so it's kind of a yes you've answered my question thank you <laughs> <laughs> so that's where we are hence the very short break and I will also tell folks that you know you need to take care of yourself as you should do so as we finish powering through the rest of these um surveys so let's get started looks like we're all back and I will turn it over to my staff. Well, Dr. Brittany. Johnson, Dr. Oh. Johnson, I'd just like to say thank you to Brittany Hyder from New South Associates for being with us today. Brittany was the principal investigator for the Hope County survey. And um, I'll let her give her presentation. Yes, thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Beth. I will jump right in. This will be a, Hope County was a smaller county, so this will be a little bit more concise. Um, but yeah, we'll just jump right in. Can everybody see the, what's on the screen here? The map? I can, yes. Perfect. Okay, great. So the ongoing Hope County Comprehensive Survey began in August 2021. The three-phase effort included an initial scoping phase in which previously surveyed sites were revisited and potential survey sites were identified. Um, a, the next phase was a comprehensive survey of rural Hope County, and the third was a survey of resources within Rayford, the Hope County seat. Hope County occupies 392 square miles in the Sand Hills and Coastal Plain regions of North Carolina. A portion of the 251 square mile Fort Liberty military installation, formerly named Fort Bragg, occupies the northern half of the county and was excluded from the survey area. Founded in 1911, Hope County is one of the youngest counties in North Carolina, formed by portions of Robeson and Cumberland counties. The county is physically distinct in that it occupies two ecological regions. Roughly the northern two thirds of the county lie within the sand hills, which are defined by dense forest of longleaf pine and scrub oak, while the southern third falls within the flatwoods of the outer coastal plain. Waterways form three of the county's borders, the largest being the Lumber River, which forms the county's western border with Scotland County. The floodplain of the Lumber River supports swampy regions and cypress forests. The county is home to exclusively Blackwater rivers and streams. Prior to European American settlement, present day Hoke County was occupied by the Shraw and Lumbee tribes. The county currently falls within the Lumbee tribal territory and extends through portion, that extends through portions of Robeson, Hoke, Cumberland, and Scotland counties. Most of Hoke County's first European settlers were Highland Scots who entered the Cape Fear region between 1735 and 1775 and moved into the Sand Hills and Southwestern Coastal Plain. The region was sparsely populated until the mid-19th century, though Presbyterian congregations were established as early as 1758. Commercial farming on a large scale was not common in Hope County until after the Civil War, when cotton became the region's primary cash crop. Farmers in the Sand Hills found success cultivating large crops of tobacco and fruits, and the lumber and turpentine indus industries were key components of the county's early economy. The dense forest of longleaf pines in the northern section of the county provided lumber and supported the colonial shipping industry, and tar, pitch, and turpentine were produced from these abundant stands. The county be began to develop in earnest with the construction of the Aberdeen and Rockfish Railroad in 1892 and the Southern Laurenburg and Southern Railroad in 1908 that converged near Rayford. 
Rayford, the Hoe County seat, initially developed around 1890, the 1895 Rayford Institute, which was a co-educational school established by a community of Scottish and Scots-Irish families. By 1911, the county was home to 10,000 residents, and Rayford was officially named the new county seat. Hoe County was significantly impacted by the construction of Fort Bragg, which developed between 1918 and 1921 as a World War I artillery training center. The U.S. government acquired 92,000 acres from Hope County for the creation of Fort Bragg, and the federal presence continues to mark the landscape today. Prior to this survey, Hope County had not been the subject of an intensive architectural survey or included in regional reconnaissance surveys. Over the years, the state office has assigned 44 site numbers to historic properties in Hope County, which is fewer than any other county in North Carolina. Of these, three resources fall within the boundaries of Fort Liberty, and prior to the survey, four individual properties, properties in Hope County had been listed in the National Register, as well as one historic district, the Rayford Historic District. Three properties were placed on the North Carolina study list, one of which has been demolished and one of which has been moved to a new location. Though excluded from the resurvey, two properties within Fort Liberty have been determined eligible for the National Register through the Section 106 review process. The first property we're going to be talking about today is the Rayford Fire Lookout Tower. The North Carolina Forest Service constructed this nine-story tower in 1968 to provide a sheltered fire observation point in the center of the county. It was one of two fire towers constructed in the county, the other being located atop McCain Hospital in the northwest section. Hope County's 20th century economy was reliant on farming, and the area was particularly susceptible to large-scale, fast-spreading fires. The Rayford Fire Lookout Tower was staffed seven days a week. Um, October to June was considered fire season, with the highest rates of fires occurring between February and April when farmers burned field grasses. The fire tower was outfitted with an azimuth circle, a compass, and a radio to establish direction and allow the observers to communicate with those posted in nearby towers. The Rayford Fire Tower measures approximately 20 by 22 feet, it is approximately 120 feet tall. The steel truss frame structure has a square observation cab that provides a 360 view of the surrounding area. The lookout tower shares a parcel with two buildings constructed in 1984 by the Forest Service, an office located approximately 100 feet south of the tower and a garage. Um, the state began discontinuing the use of fire towers in the 1990s. The Rayford Fire Tower is recommended for the North Carolina study list under Criterion A in the area of conservation. The tower is locally significant as the only remaining freestanding tower in Hope County. Fire towers would have been key in the protection of the county's resources. By the mid 20th century, Hope County's economy was supported by agriculture, particularly cotton farming. In 1956, Hope County farmers ginned about 6,000 bales of cotton and cotton supported the city's manufacturing industries, including cotton seed oil plants and textile processing. Fire detection would have been a major concern for farmers who sought to protect their crops and economic interests. The tower's recommended period of significance extends from its construction in 1968 forward. The next resource is the potential McCain Historic District, which contains three interrelated state-owned facilities that can community of McCain and occupy a 2,000 acre tract spanning both sides of Aberdeen Road in West Hope County. This complex of buildings were used as health and correctional facilities throughout the 20th century and include the former North Carolina Sanatorium for the Treatment of Tuberculosis, which includes two segregated wards. A facility for Black patients was converted to the Samuel Leonard Training School in 1959 and later the Sand Hills Youth Center in 1974. The Hope Correctional Institution, which was constructed in phases between 1948 and 1982, um, is also part of the complex. So power for the three facilities was provided by a coal-fired coal power plant constructed in 1908 when the first sanatorium campus was built. Operations at all three of these facilities are currently suspended, and during the survey, we were able to gain limited access to two of the three facilities. Our access to the Hoke Correctional Institution was limited to exterior photography from outside of security fencing. 
The complex represents the 20th century governmental presence in this section of Hope County and a tr transition of the property from medical to correctional use. The oldest of the three buildings is the North Carolina Sanatorium for the Treatment of Tuberculosis. Located on the northeast side of Aberdeen Road, this campus is significant as the state's first purpose-built sanitarium for tuberculosis treatment. The complex was constructed in phases between 1908 and the mid-20th century, and the building site, known as Blues Mountain, is the highest elevation in the county and was selected for its warm, dry breezes. Initially, the state allocated $25,000 annually toward the operation of the facility, and patients were charged a dollar a day for treatment. The campus included a post office, store, com and commissary for employees and patients, and the facility's grounds consisted of about 1,500 acres of forest managed by the State Department of Forestry and 500 acres of farmland, farmland that supported a dairy herd. In 1923, the North Carolina General Assembly allocated $100,000 for construction of a quote-unquote colored division at the ho hospital, which added about 50 beds for African-American patients. In 1925, the hospital opened division, a division for imprisoned patients, followed by a wing for children in 1927. At its height, the facility contained about 650 beds. The waiting period for a bed could last as long as nine to 10 months, and treatment lasted between six months to two years. In 1939, the state constructed a separate hospital for the treatment of Black patients about a mile southeast, which we will see in a few slides, and the complex was renamed McCain Hospital in 1973, when it was transferred to the state's Division of Prisons in 83, when it was renamed a second time, becoming McCain Correctional Hospital. And it was used as a healthcare facility for minimum custody male prisoners until 2010. So the building is defined by three east-facing facades that represent each of the primary building campaigns. The one you see here is the oldest section of the building is its U-shaped core, Constructed in 1908, this two-story section has a raised basement and a hipped roof. The building is constructed of brick laid in an English bond with a cast stone bell course. The roof's wide eaves are supported by sawn brackets paired at the building's corners. A stepped parapet with a centered arch and cast on coping rises above the roof line. The next section is the north end of the building, which contains the building's former main entrance and the facade that is most commonly associated with the facility. It is often depicted on the facility's brochures and postcards. Portion of the building was constructed, this portion was constructed between 1921 and 1927 and was significantly modified in the mid 20th century with the addition of the front rooms you see here and updated fenestration. And here we have a comparison of a older postcard and a current view of the North Wing. The south end of the building is a two-story hip roof section constructed around 1930. This section is defined by a prominent pedimented entrance bay clad in cast stone. Four cast stone pilasters support the gable front pediment and surround the main entrance. The entrance is recessed within a one-story bay etched with a double barred cross and windows throughout were updated when the facility was transferred to the Department of Corrections in 1983. Replace Placement windows are fixed aluminum designs with cast stone sills. This wing is connected to the 1908 core to the north by a recessed hyphen that shares the same brick coursing, exposed rafter ends, and the roof line of the circa 1930 wing. There's some additional photos of the circa 1930 wing here. Around 1955, a two-story flat roof wing designed by Raleigh architect F. Carter Williams was added to the west elevation to house the hospital's morgue. Windows in this section are steel awning designs, often paired and sheltered with flat roof awnings that wrap the building's corners. One, two, fast. Most of the building's interior finishes date to the 1980s, including the acoustic tile ceilings, plain hollow core wood doors, Laboratory spaces in the south wing feature the original plaster and tile skirt walls. Chapel in the circa 1955 edition retains the original wood paneling, pews, and protruding brick. Supporting buildings on the campus include a 1925 nursing nurses home designed by Eric G. Flanagan, housing for doctors that was situated on either side of the hospital, and the 1908 coal-fired plant shown here. While not open for detailed photography, these buildings contribute to the campus's overall historic feel and are a remnant of the supporting buildings that would have allowed this complex to be self-sustaining. 
Located about one mile to the south, the second contributing element to the McCain Historic District is the Companion Facilities Facility for Black Patients. The core of this building was constructed by the Federal Works Agency in 1939, and the building was altered in phases between 1955 and 1974. The first and most significant renovation occurred in 1955 um, in a section that you see on the bottom right. Um, this building was expanded, was constructed when the campus expanded to house the Samuel Leonard Training School, which was operated by the North Carolina Board of Juvenile Corrections and Department of Youth Services. One of 10 training schools in North Carolina, the Samuel Leonard Training School opened in 1959 and was the result of early 20th century prison reform efforts to separate juvenile offenders from adult offenders. North Carolina established its first training schools for youth offenders in 1909 and 1918, including the nearby Samarican Manor in Moore County. And between 1909 and 1938, eight training schools were established as part of the state prison system. Around 1955, Raleigh architect F. Carter Williams designed the dominating L-shaped addition on the east side of the hospital to house the bulk of the facility. The historic core of the complex is shown here in yellow. Um, it consists of a two-story wing at the north end of the building that features elements of the colonial revival style. Sheltered by a side gable roof, this section of the building is clad in brick laid in a common pond. Windows are set in banks of three with original 16 pane metal casements with eight pane transoms and pebble dash caprons. Eyebrow dormers that retain original six light metal sash are located along the roof line. The 1955 edition is shown here. Standing at three stories, the 1955 international style edition is defined by its, by its streamlined linear design created by a flat roof and ribbons of 12 horizontal pane steel design awning windows that extend across the facade and west elevations. The corner windows on the projecting wing of the southern elevation emphasize the addition's horizontality and the main entrance is sheltered on the north end by the massive second stories, which are supported by round cast in place concrete plinths, giving a cantilevered effect. The facility was converted to house a minimum security correctional institution for young men named the Sandhills Youth Center in 1974 and is currently not, a, not in use. The interior was inaccessible due to environmental concerns, but sections of the first floor were visible from the exterior, as you can see on the bottom left. The first floor appears to have been updated with modern finishes, including drywall, tile floors, and drop ceilings. In addition to the hospital and training school, a mid-century gymnasium, one-story office building, and a circa 1940 house for medical staff complete the campus. While access was limited, the Hope Correctional Institution is located on the east side of North Carolina 211 or Aberdeen Road. Constructed in phases between 1948 and 82, this collection of buildings exhibits similar design features to those of its companion institutions, including flat roof wings, multi-pane ribbons of windows with brick, brick spandrels. The McCain Historic District is recommended for the North Carolina study list under Criterion A in the areas of, of poly. The complex is a significant state institution built specifically for this treatment of tuberculosis that gradually transitioned to a correctional complex. The district includes a mid 20th century example of a state sponsored training school for imprisoned youth and represents the governmental presence in Northwest Hope County. Additionally, the complex is recommended eligible under Criterion C for architecture as an intact collection of buildings that display the government's evolution, a go governmental facilities evolution, and capture the architectural trends of the periods in which they were constructed, including a unique example of the international style in Hope County. The recommended period of significance extends from the date of the oldest building on the campus, which is 1908, forward. The next resource is Camp Rockfish. Camp Rockfish is located in eastern Hope County near its intersection with Robeson and Cumberland counties on Rockfish Creek. The camp was established by the Methodist Church as a retreat center and opened on August 1st, 1965. The camp began with one central lodge and six cabins on 400 acres fronting the south bank of Lake Upchurch. About 100, 140 of these acres are in Hope County. 
Churches from the Fayetteville and Sanford districts of the denomination donated funds for the camp, which accommodated 30 students per week. The original, let's see, yes, the original cabins and lodge were designed by Fayetteville architects Mason Hicks and Jim Willis, designers of the 1969 Fayetteville Airport. The team received an AIA award for its design in 1966. The Rockfish Lodge, which is shown here, and attached camp store are defined by angular modernist elements offset by rustic material treatments. The lodge's cross gable form is reminiscent of an A-frame building, a form associated with rustic architecture. The layered angular roof frame spans of windows on each elevation and fixed inset horizontal light corner windows and pent casement windows are sited just above the cast concrete foundation, tilting to meet the eaves of the extended roof line. They're a bit more visible from the interior as shown here. Um, the lodge is clad in irregularly spaced wood for board and batten siding. And the interior retains the original wood paneling, exposed wood rafters, and narrowly spaced purlins and polished concrete floors. Original interior screen doors feature diagonal cross bracing. Like the lodge, the original six cabins are A-frame designs with concrete foundations and painted board and batten exteriors. Cabins one through five are almost identical with double-leaf main entrances topped by louvered windows and three fixed single light windows along each of the supporting elevations. While some cabins have been modified with the addition of replacement doors and windows, each retains its original form and interior and exterior finishes. When constructed, each cabin contains space for five, camp five campers and a counselor's room. The lodge and six, here's a quick view of the interior. The lodge and six cabins front Lake Upchurch and are surrounded by recreational features, including docks, a kayak and canoe rack, and a nearby ropes course. In the mid-1980s, the camp evolved from an overnight camp for school-aged children to a retreat center with construction of the Berkland Re Retreat Center and Hotel. Between 1990 and 2010, eight additional camp buildings were constructed, including a dining hall, office, four additional cabins, and a multi-purpose building named the Carolina Building. All of these buildings display rustic exterior treatments and blend into the landscape. Camp Rockfish is recommended for the North Carolina Study List under Criterion C as a significant example of modernist architecture in Hoe County. It may also be significant under Criterion A in the area of entertainment and recreation as a locally important example of a mid-20th century recreational facility pending further context development. The recommended period of significance extends from the dates of construction in 1965 forward. The next resource, the Hope County Cotton Warehouse, is a nine building complex that includes four large warehouses, an office, two pump houses, and two sheds. While all of the buildings appear to date to the mid 20th century, the company itself was founded in 1922 and has been associated with the site since its founding. A review of historic aerials shows us that the complex has displayed the same footprint cements for the Hope Cotton Warehouse and Storage Company appear in the Rayford News Journal by September 1944. The need for cotton storage emerged in the first decades of the 20th century, when the outbreak of World War I all but eliminated cotton export markets. As early as 1909, North Carolina farmers stressed the need for a centrally located and well-managed cotton warehouse where farmers could store crops until they were able to secure the highest market price for their yields. A September 1914 article outlined Hope County's plan to build three cotton warehouses with the capacity to house 2,000 bales. That year, Hope County farmers produced 15,000 bales of cotton. The complex on South Jackson Street appears in advertisements in the Hope News Journal in 1961 as a government bonded warehouse well equipped with a fire suppression system. The utilitarian complex stands just northeast of the Aberdeen and Rockfish rail line, which would have brought bales in from the rural areas during harvest for storage. The warehouses are either of wood or metal frame construction. The southernmost warehouse shown here is defined by brick firewalls with large wooden barn doors and a loading platform on the south end. Sunken concrete loading platform is also located just behind the office shown here on the right side and the offices on the left. Um, each of the buildings retains a high degree of integrity, including most of the original exterior finishes, 
and the presence of two pump houses communicate the importance of fire protection and prevention. So the Hope County Cotton Warehouse is recommended for the North Carolina study list under Criterion A in the area of agriculture. The complex is an intact local example of a cotton warehouse and would have been a key part of Hope County's agricultural economy. As discussed earlier, Hope County farmers ginned 6,000 bales of cotton in 1956, and the warehouse would have ensured that farmers received the best price for their yields and had the ability to pay their loans, bolstering the county's economy. The recommended period of ex significance extends from the complex's construction circa 1945 forward, and the warehouse operated until 2020, but is no longer in use. The next building is the Rayford Waterworks. The Rayford Waterworks complex was constructed in 1952 and occupies a one and a half acre parcel at the southwest corner of North Dixon Street and West Donaldson Street below the rail line. In 1951, Rayford residents voted in favor of a $180,000 bond for street, water, and sewer improvements, including an additional $30,000 for extending and enlarging the waterworks service in town. The city developed the Dixon Street complex between 1952 and 1983. The complex is anchored by a one-story flat roof building shown here that houses an office and chemical storage in the front wing and a pump house at the rear. The city of Rayford likely improved and expanded the complex in the mid-1970s as a result of statewide training. A 1971 edition of the News Journal reported that Chester B. Beasley Jr. of Rayford attended the annual Waterworks Operators School held at NC State. The school was a joint effort conducted by NC State's Department of Civil Engineering, the North Carolina Section of the American Waterworks Association, and the Board of Health. For the purpose of it, the purpose of the conference was improving the general level of water plant operation. So at this session, operators were taught the latest developments in techniques, and Rayford operators likely utilized tools and methods learned at this conference when adding structures to the facility. In 1972, the city held a second vote to provide funds for extending and improving the waterworks and sent a second representative from Rayford to the state operator school. The office and chemical storage shown, building are shown here, and these buildings share, a, share the parcel with an elevated water tower, a clean water storage tank, a concrete well, and at the top right, you'll see an aerator and filtration system that was used to oxidize iron. The aerator was designed to create a larger water surface by producing splashing water in the, the round section, and that would oxidize the iron and other metal elements out of the groundwater. The iron and other metals would then pass through a series of filters in the three tubes or supports that are at the base of the structure, and the central pillar would have fed water into the structure. The Rayford Waterworks is recommended for the North Carolina study list under Criterion A in the area of community planning and development. The complex is an intact local example of a progressive public utility that would have been integral to Rayford becoming a modern city. The rec recommended period of significance extends from the date of the first building's construction in 1952 forward. This classical revival dwelling was constructed for the Covington family circa 1915. William Thomas Covington was a prominent citizen in Hope County. According to the 1910 census, he owned a farm in the Kewiffle Township and was key in the development of the county itself. Prior to the election of county officials, Covington was one of two commissioners appointed to determine the boundaries of the new county, alongside neighboring Cumberland and Robinson County commissioners. W.T. Covington married Margaret Neal of Marion, North Carolina in 1904, and the Covingtons likely moved to Donaldson Avenue around the time of their marriage. By the 1920 census, the Covingtons lived on Donaldson Avenue with their three children. William listed his occupation as a farmer, and then by 1930, he was superintendent of a general farm as well as a well-known sculptor. According to the current property owner, Cecil Lynch, the house remained in the Covington family throughout most of the 20th century, and was passed to W.T. Covington Jr., a successful attorney in Charlotte. The Covington House is located almost centrally on a one and a half acre parcel at the northeast corner of West Donaldson and Fulton Street in Rayford. The parcel is surrounded by short brick piers with rusticated stone caps that frame wrought iron gates at the West Donaldson Avenue entrance. The dwelling is fronted by a wide brick path that begins on the north side 
and ends at the houses of West Donaldson Avenue and ends at the house's entrance. This frames a landscape garden bed containing boxwoods and according to Mr. Lynch, a tennis court stood east of the house. Architecturally, the house is defined by a dominant full height portico centered on the south facade. This U-shaped portico features a flat roof with a stickwork balustrade that is supported by smooth Tuscan columns with ionic capitals. A one-story hip roof porch wraps the south facade and portions of the east and west elevation with matched Tuscan wood columns and, turned, and a turned wood balustrade. The, roof's port, the porch's roof line is interrupted by a center bay balcony at the second level. And the main entrance is centered on the south facade, has an original single pane glass and wood door flanked by leaded glass side lights. Windows throughout the house are one over one wood sash flanked by louvered shutters. On the interior, the house retains many of the original finishes when the floor, first floor retains most of the original floor plan. The main entrance provides access to a foyer, which features a walnut staircase and newel post paneled wainscoting, and in an original walnut mantle with a set grate and glazed tile surround. An intricate plaster medallion surrounds the room chandelier and a pair of multi-plane hanging glass and wood French doors with the ultralight transom divide the foyer from the hall. Pocket doors divide the stair hall from the front, front parlor just west of the foyer, and the parlor features a decorative cornice formed by applied plaster surface dunes and in an original cabinet mantle. The Covington House is recommended for the North Carolina Study List under Criterion C as a local example of classical revival architecture. The period of significance is based on the dwelling's construction circa 1915. And the dwelling shares a parcel with a row of modified outbuildings shown here, including a former stable that was converted to a secondary living space and a garage, as well as a frame shed. Let's see. The final resource that we are recommending is the Rayford Residential Historic District. Consisting of about 147 acres, the potential historic district is situated on the north and west side of Rayford's commercial core. The district developed in stages between 1905 and 1936 on subdivided land owned by the Blue and Covington families. Um, on the aerial view on the left, the recommended district is shown with a pink, the pinkish red boundary and the existing Rayford um, Historic District, which is anchored by commercial buildings, is shown in by the blue boundary. So the potential historic district contains approximately 135 dwellings constructing between 1900 and 1965 by the city's middle class professionals and wealthy industrialists. I'll just move through some examples as we go over these. The district contains the city's best examples of early 20th century residential architecture and including, as well as academic examples of classical and colonial revival dwellings, such as the TB and Mary Upchurch, Upchurch House shown here, um, which was one of, these were constructed by some of the county's most prominent farmers and industrialists. Um, so these blocks are, houses are found alongside more modest one and two story craftsmen and two to revival influenced houses. Um, including the ones at 411 Magnolia Street and Prospect Street shown here. The city's main arteries, North Main Street and West Prospect Avenue, bisect the district, which is defined by the city's flat topography and shaded and mature pines and oaks. The district consists of, consists of lots ranging in size from about a half acre to one acre, laid on a grid with sidewalks running parallel to the main streets. Those are some of the the younger buildings. Uh, most parcels feature some level of formal landscaping and site features, including rows of boxwoods, bricks, brick drives or paths, or masonry plants that frame the entrances. Common outbuildings include detached garages, workshops, well houses, and carports. Though most of the buildings are single family dwellings, the district also contains the WA, WPA constructed former Rayford High School that dates to 1934 as well as the 1921 Rayford Presbyterian Church, which anchors the district southeast corner. The Rayford Residential Historic District is recommended for the North Carolina study list under Criterion C for its architectural significance. The period of significance extends from circa 1905, the date of the oldest buildings in the district, to about 1965, when the last mid 20th century ranch houses and other modernist inspired dwellings were constructed. 
The district is roughly bounded by 7th Street to the north, Stewart Street to the east. I can go back to our map here. Harris and Donaldson Avenues to the south, North Bethel Road, and North Fulton Street to the west. And that is our final recommendation. Thank you, everybody. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I did have a question for Ramona. Um, this concerns just the the Covington House. Um, I'm on the board for PNC and the Covington Foundation provides us with significant financial support. Do we need to recuse ourselves from just this one property or can we still vote? Well, I, thank you, Dr. Johnson. I, I, I would ask who owns the Covington House now. I don't know that the presentation covered it's, that or not. It's no longer in the Covington family. Okay. Well, then that, yeah. Okay. That's I, I would question. think that's a, 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 a coincidental uh, connection <laughs> other than one that's um, relative to conflicts, in, in my opinion, but that's just my opinion. No, that, that makes it easier for us. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's currently owned by, um, a gentleman named Cecil Lynch, and I okay. know he purchased it from the Covingtons, but I don't think he's a relation in any way. No, my my main concern was like that direct connection yeah. that could be perceived, but nah, we're we're good, Doctor Brothers. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? I know that um, Sh um, Sean will not be voting on this particular one, but I do have. A Go ahead. I do have a question. Um, you mentioned that, Brittany, that um, Camp Rockfish received an Arctushal Award, I believe. Do Correct. you, is that, uh, at what level? Was that a national award? Was that the North Carolina state level, a local chapter, or, or are you aware the, of which level? I believe it was the state level, but I would have to confirm that and get back to you. Yeah. That would have some impact. It's um, uh, as you can imagine, I'm sure. Uh, national level are much harder to get. State level are not terribly uncommon, and, and local chapters give lots of awards. So it would have some impact eventually. Okay, my memory leads me to believe that it's state level, but I would need to confirm that. Sure, sure. Thank you. Are there any other questions? And I'd like to thank you, Brittany, for giving us that thorough and concise um, presentation. So at this point, I will entertain a motion. I would move for acceptance. <laughs> so that's Joe Opperman has moved to accept I'll second it. David Denard is, has seconded it. Thank you so much. And I'll go through the roll call again. Starting with eyes. David Bergstone. Aye. David Denard. Aye. David Ruffin. Aye. Joe Opperman. Aye. Josie Ward. Aye. Dr. Fitz. Aye. Honorable Clark. Aye. Dr. Brothers. Aye. And Valerie Ann Johnson, aye. And if there, that's all our list. So there are no opposition. And so it's accepted on the study list. Thank you so very much, Brittany. Great. And Thanks. Beth for helping us go through all these. Thank you. Well Absolutely. done. Thank you very much, Brittany. And then I believe we can turn it over to our last presenter um, and that will be Heather Carpini from uh, the consulting firm of S&ME. Um, and Heather worked on the update to the existing Salisbury National Register District 
and I'll let her explain her recommendations following that project. Thank you, Beth. Let me get this started. All right, so let's see. Can you see my slide? All right, so we'll go from there. Let me move you over. All right. Uh, this study application stems from an architectural survey update project for the Salisbury Historic District. The city of Salisbury is a certified local government, which received a matching grant from the National Park Service for an intensive survey of the existing Salisbury National Register Historic District. As part of this project, there was also an interest in a potential expansion for the period of significance and a potential boundary increase for the district. The survey inventoried 404 resources located within the Salisbury NRHD boundaries and looked at surrounding areas to the Northwest, West and Southwest for a potential boundary increase. And... There we go. Salisbury is the county seat of Rowan County, which is centrally located approximately halfway between Charlotte and Greensboro on Interstate 85. The existing Salisbury Historic District was listed in the National Register in 1975 and has undergone three boundary increases since its original listing in 1988, 1989, and 2000. The current district has a period of significance from 1770 to 1950. The original district's period of significance presumably ended in 1925, the 50-year threshold for listing at the time, and the subsequent boundary increases have extended the date to 1950. The Salisbury National Register Historic District is listed under Criterion C for architecture and for the commerce and community development areas of significance under Criterion A. The resources within the existing boundaries of the Salisbury National Register Historic District include a mixture of commercial, residential, government, and religious buildings, which represent the growth and development of Salisbury from its founding through 1950. These are examples of some of the buildings within the existing historic district. This map shows the approximately 15 block boundary increase study area, which was surveyed at a reconnaissance level to assess the potential for another boundary increase to the Salisbury Historic District. In addition to the recommendation for a boundary increase, we recommended an extension of the period of significance for the entire district from an end date of 1950 to an end date of 1975 and the development of a context for a new area of significance under Criterion A, specifically ethnic heritage Black, and community planning and development. The boundary increase recommendations that are presented on the next slides are contingent upon the recommended extension of a period of significance and the additional documentation for the new areas of significance. While we recognize that the boundaries are never final and still reviewed and accepted by the National Park Service, we have endeavored to present a realistic and defensible boundary based on the information gathered during our field survey. That can be refined during National Register of Historic Places nomination preparation. This map shows the recommended boundary increase for the Salisbury National Register Historic District. It includes 230 parcels of which 31 are vacant lots and nine are post 1975 infill. The majority of the recommended boundary increase is residential, with houses representing an array of architectural styles that were popular during the period of 1900 to 1975, including Queen Anne, Craftsman, Colonial Revival, and ranch houses. Interspersed within the residential areas are churches, which were an important fixture in early 20th century neighborhoods. There's also a small corridor of mid 20th century commercial development near the intersection of Lincolnton Road and South Fulton Street, which are two heavily traveled thoroughfares that create physical boundaries for the separating for the surrounding residential areas. Specific sections of the recommended boundary increase convey separate aspects about the settlement and development of residential neighborhoods around the historic core of Salisbury. The area east of Fulton Street represents the expansion of white settlement along South Church, Jackson, and Fulton Streets, as well as the cross streets of each block. Although smaller than the expansive houses that had been constructed along both, both Fulton Street and in areas to the north, 
The residences in this area were examples of middle-class white housing, and the lots were mostly built up by the mid-1920s. The lots generally have uniform setbacks, and the houses are one and one and a half story and two stories, which are generally similar in sizing and massing. In addition to the high, high percentage of residents, the area east of Fulton Street also contains two churches and a handful of commercial buildings located along Fulton Street. Although located west of Fulton Street, the area along the 800 block of South Ellis retains a significantly high concentration of buildings that retain a high degree of integrity. There are 14 resources dating from between 1925 to 1930. Along the east side of the block, there are three historic two-story apartment buildings and four one-story residences, while along the west side are five single-family residences and two historic two-story du historically duplex buildings. This block, block has Boyden High School, which is now Salisbury High School, as its distinct southern boundary was platted in 1927 and was fully built out by 1931. On the north side of the 500 block of West Bank Street are two residences that fit within the period of significance and character of the original Salisbury Historic District and are recommended for inclusion in the boundary increase. These two houses are both one-story gable front and wing buildings with inset hip roof porches. The plan of these residences is one that can be seen throughout the existing district and they both retain a high degree of integrity of design, materials, workmanship, and feeling. The remaining areas east of Fulton Street is primarily residential and was historically part of early 20th century African American residential areas, which were generally located on the fringes of white residential areas. The later development with a higher number of post 1920 resources and a higher concentration of mid 20th century infill in this area can be attributed to the historic association with houses occupied by black residents. The section bounded by McCubbin Street, South Craig Street, West Marsh Street, and South Ellis Street, as well as the 600 block and a portion of the 500 block of West Monroe Street, were identified on Sanborn maps as being African-American neighborhoods during the 1920s through the 1950s. At the same time, the 300 block through the 800 block of South Caldwell Street, spanning between West Bank Street and Harrison Street, was also comprised of Black residents. The demographic makeup of the people who lived on these blocks accounts for the generally smaller lot size and subsequently smaller building footprints of the buildings and structures in the area. The portion of the recommended boundary increase tells the story of a broader history of Salisbury, one that includes Black residents who coexisted along with their white neighbors in houses that were often smaller and sometimes situated on more marginal land with lots that were generally less desirable because of topography, drainage, and dis tra travel distance to commercial centers. The buildings in this section are generally one to two story residences with uniform setbacks, although there are also two churches within the proposed boundary increase. Some of the structures have alterations, such as replacement windows and siding, and there are some with more extensive changes, including additions and porch enclosures. But these types of changes are also evident within the existing Salisbury National Register Historic District boundaries. These changes also tell the story of generational disparity in housing opportunities and ultimately wealth between white and black populations, which in influence the material integrity and extent that the extant buildings have. The historically black portion of the proposed boundary increase does include some buildings with notable architectural and historical significance with a concentration of these located along the 500 and 600 blocks of West Monroe Street. These include the house of Dr. William Coleman, a black physician in Salisbury during the early to mid 20th century at 629 West Monroe Street, the Mary A. Lynch house at 624 West Monroe Street, the residence of the longtime librarian at Livingstone College, the house of Wiley I. Lash, an influential member of the black community and the first black mayor of Salisbury, at 526 West Monroe Street, and the house of successful contractor Alfonso Patrick at 529 West Monroe Street. In terms of the extended period of significance ending in 1975, we believe that this is an appropriate end to an extension of the period of significance for the existing Salisbury Historic District and as an end date for the proposed boundary increase. 
Although this ending date is slightly more recent than the 50-year threshold for NRHP listing, it was chosen based on the assumption that by the time this documentation of this proposed period of significance and potential boundary increase was completed, it would likely be the 50-year cutoff. The extension of the period of significance to 1975 incorporates the nascent years of the historic preservation movement in Salisbury, including the founding of the historic Salisbury Foundation in 1972 and the beginnings of work to establish and retain, retain a thriving historic district. For the existing historic district, there are 23 resources of the 404 identified within the district that were constructed within this 25 year period. Notable examples of buildings that date to this period between 1950 and 1975 include the former Wachovia Bank Building at 130 South Main Street, built in 1967, the McClellan Building at 112 114 South Main Street, built in 1965, the Lily K. Lentz House at 407 South Church Street, built in 1968, the Thurston Dental Office at 316 South Church Street, built in 1955, the chapel at St. Lutheran, St. John's Lutheran Church, built in 1967, and the Rowan County Library, built in 1951. Within the proposed boundary increase, there are 30 resources con constructed between 1950 and 1975. With some specific examples include the 1964 Trinity Presbyterian Church and its 1963 Ranch House, both on South Caldwell Street. The 1965 and 1969 residences on West Monroe Street and 1962 and 1969 apartment buildings flanking a 1938 apartment building on South Ellis Street and this 1954 automobile service garage, which incidentally has restrooms with original fixtures and tile. Additionally, the presence of a large number of 1950 to 1975 buildings was partially because of the de facto buffer zone that had been developed between the white residential areas and the black residential areas during the 1910s through the 1950s, which left open lots along these border areas that were put under development at the beginning of the 1950s. The reason for the availability of these lots and the construction of houses on them during 1950 through 1975 it's part of the broader story of the demographic development of this portion of the proposed boundary increase. In summary, we recommend a boundary increase for the Salisbury National Register Historic District with these boundaries to the study list, with the recommendation for an expanded period of significance ending in 1975 for the entire district, and with additional documentation into ethnic heritage, Black, and community planning and development as areas of significance. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Do I, I'd like to first um, commend you all, all of our presenters for giving us such thorough, um, such thorough studies. And um, I do appreciate your comment on why you would like to go to, to a little bit, extend the time a little bit. <laughs> I think it's prudent, <laughs> but that's my opinion. Um, at this point, are there any questions for Heather? I have one question. Uh, Heather, how was this boundary increase initiated? Who initiated this? The um, city of Salisbury gave us a 16 block study area that they thought um, could be potentially eligible for a boundary increase. And so we took that 16 blocks and um, narrowed the boundary down from that area based on um, areas that had integrity and his, we thought historic significance. Yeah, I'm encouraged to finally see that connection made over to Livingston College, the residential area that extended into the college that was sort of excluded previously. I'm glad to see this all expanding. It's great. Absolutely. Yep, I, I agree as well. It, it is part of what I know we've talked about in previous um, NRAC meetings about encouraging um, folks to look deeper, wider at the, the histories, especially those that have been excluded. So we, I appreciate this um, recommendation. I think it butts up to three, three other districts now. 
Is that right? You can show the other adjoining districts. But I think in Livingstone, the high school, and then the um, Ellis Street graded school district are all very tied to this. Mm -hmm. Maybe another one. But yeah, this, I mean, I've lived and worked in Salisbury, and so this makes lots of sense to me. This area finally gets recognized. It's for this potential. Thank you, David B. I appreciate that, that comment and your perspective. Any other questions or comments from Ms. Carpini? I have a, um, a, a general question. Like you said, Dr. Johnson, we've um, had these conversations before in particular, particularly around HBCUs. Just a um, question for our overall staff. Is there um, an initiative for, for continued um, education for community members and residents? I, I believe, Dr. Brothers, that because Salisbury is a certified local government, that um, their staff is very well uh, enabled to discuss preservation issues with their constituents. And of course, our staff, um, especially our local government coordinator, Christy Brantley, and then our, mm -hmm. our survey and restoration staff who have Rowan County in their service area, I know will be happy to assist the, the local government with any uh, community outreach efforts that need to happen. Um, certainly, I would imagine before this study list recommendation would move forward to National Register that some education efforts um, would absolutely be recommended um, to be take, undertaken at that local city level by the CLG with support from our office. That, I like, I would, thank you for that comment. Go ahead, um, uh, Sarah. I would just add more, more broadly and generally, uh, there we don't have a, any kind of set official um, outreach, but certainly um, as our office works and interacts with um, with localities when when people call and say we want to do you know a survey or a national register district or an expansion to an existing district um, we are we're cognizant of um, trying to make sure these projects are really um, inclusive and thoughtful and uh, looking at um, at a community's uh, whole history and um, and have been encouraging just a much more, um, everybody keeps using the word inclusive, but there's no better word, <laughs> um, an approach that really tries to look at the community in a more holistic way. I would also offer um, too, because um, I know the department is in the process of reviewing proposals for the HBCU and minority Institution of Higher Education internship program. Um, maybe thinking about incorporating that as a proposal for the following summer with students at the universities. Yeah, yeah, we can definitely, um, definitely investigate, investigate that. Mm -hmm. And I would also encourage really that close um, so relationship between the CLGs and y'all's offices with the HBCUs that because the CLGs have that mandate and that capacity that mm -hmm. they can, um, I won't say take the lead, but they can do some more. I would encourage them to be more, have more initiative in reaching out to communities because not only do communities need to be educated, but they are also able to educate the CLGs. And, yes. and I've learned that um, the wonderful example is the historic African-American neighborhood historic district that Greensboro um, is proposing. I mean, it, the energy of the community in coming out and explaining how they understand, even naming whether it's going to be bimbo or not, that area was important and very to me, very noticeable. So it's not just going one direction. Mm -hmm. Communities have a lot to offer coming back in terms of knowledge, energy, and um, interest. Yes, absolutely. Yes, the intern can help initiate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. May, may I add a comment, a follow up on uh, Dr. Johnson's comment there? 
Uh, last year at this time, when we were reviewing study lists, um, we had a um, presentation on the city of Tarboro. And I raised the question at the time about um, some very distinctive architectural details that shows up in the late 19th century neighborhood there. And at the time, nobody really uh, had much information about who might be doing this because clearly there's a pattern in Tarboro of architectural detail, Victorian details that are repeated over and over and over again mm -hmm. that are very distinctive for the community. And since that time, uh, looking at that uh, very fine exhibit prepared by Preservation North Carolina on uh, black craftsmen uh, and their contribution to the state's architecture, there was um, highlighted a, uh, a, a formerly enslaved person who was um, became a general contractor in Toroboro and uh, his house had a, a number of these features exhibited. And it also highlighted a fellow that he frequently collaborated with, who was, again, a formerly enslaved person who was a, a carpenter. And my immediate first suspicion was, maybe that um, fellow that collaborated with him might be the person that was contributing these very distinctive features that are all over in Tarboro. It would be a wonderful research project for somebody. I, I'd love to do it, but I don't have the time to do it um, independently. But boy, it would be a wonderful thing to put a student onto the topic and let them loose and follow up on that. And I, it would be quite a contribution to learn something along those lines. So anybody that has somebody in mind that they might um, uh, get them interested in the topic, just like we have a number of other interesting topics that come up. There are a number of things that come up in these meetings that would be well worth following up on. That's just my two cents. Yep, that, that would make a great collaboration with PNC as well. So sort of a HPO, HBCU, PNC, confab. Sure. <laughs> noted, duly noted. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. been some research in Winston-Salem too that others um, has identified some distinctive characteristics of African-American buildings. To, mm -hmm. I don't think it was ever able to attach them directly, but I mean, it's pretty clear that there's, you know, individuals are carrying, doing this work from one location to another unique details. And may I uh, uh, add a comment here? Uh, you all will recall that uh, something along these lines about uh, inclusivity uh, was mentioned when we discussed an infield project. Uh, and uh, I asked the question about uh, uh, the inclusion of African-American uh, property in that area, and uh, it was not included. And that's why I asked this question here about who initiated this boundary change, because Ramona and I, along with some other folk, uh, talked about uh, 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 what needed to happen in the town of Enfield uh, to uh, uh, create a more representative historic district uh, than the one that was proposed. So I think that's, uh, you know, all of this discussion uh, has to be continued uh, uh, with regard to educating all folk in these communities as to what needs to be done and what can be done. I think Agreed. that agreed and duly noted, and I think um, we'll put a little action behind these recommendations because they've come up more than one time. And so now we're ready to move on them. So thank you all. And speaking of moving, we do have um, our last recommendation from regarding the um, recommended boundary increase and update for the Salisbury National Register. I move to approve the recommendation. And moved I'll second by, it. So moved by David Bergstone and yes, seconded right. by David Denard. Again, I'll go through my roll call and just say aye. I'll start with the eyes again. So David Bergstone? 
Aye. And David Denard? Aye. David Ruffin? Aye. Joel Opperman? Aye. Josie Ward? Aye. Dr. Fitz? Aye. Honorable Clark? Aye. Sean Patch? Aye. And Dr. Brothers? Aye. And Valerie Ann Johnson? Aye. So it's unanimous, and thank you all so much. I would at this point um, ask if Ramona or any of her staff, Sarah, Beth, have any last remarks or things that we need to, to do. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. I just want to thank everyone again for your continued commitment to, to the roles that we've asked you to serve in, and you do it so well, and uh, all the collegiality that, that is extended throughout all of these meetings. So we, we appreciate you and, and appreciate your continued service to our, our constituents, our shared constituents in North Carolina. So thank you. Uh -huh. Good meeting. You're welcome. Yes, and I like this, this split. I think this is working for <laughs> us um, because I can only anticipate more nominations and recommendations are going to come forward with y'all busy people. With and, that, and, I will... Go ahead. Yeah, yes, ma'am. I think we're going to have to do a formal adjournment, though. And, uh, yes. and again, oh. our thanks to our to all of our team members uh, that I could not leave without saying that. Yes. And I thank the team, too, um, very much. So I will entertain a formal motion to adjourn. So move, Madam Chair. Thank you. Move. Okay. Bye. David Denard and seconded by Joel Opperman and following form for adjournment. Say aye if you are ready to adjourn. David Bergstone. Aye. David Denard. Aye. David Ruffin. Aye. Joel Opperman. Aye. Josie Ward. Aye. Dr. Fitz. Aye. Honorable Clark. Aye. Sean Patch. Aye. Dr. Brothers. Aye. And me, Valerie Ann Johnson. I thank you all. Thank you, staff, Jeff and Beth <laughs> and Sarah and Ramona. I, and, we appreciate and, it. And, and Matt. Thank, and Matt. <laughs> oh, can't forget Matt <laughs> to the rescue. So our meetings adjourned. Thank you very much, Brittany and Heather, for your presentations. And we thank our other um, folks who gave us the virtual presentation. So thank you all, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.